All right, folks. Happy Tuesday. Shall we get started? Gentlemen. That's hard. Cool. All right, so who can refresh our memory where we left off on Thursday? What is the Bell of Padua model? What is it for? Well, let's talk high level instead of the details of what it does. Yeah. Louder? Yeah, so different, uh, different ways of determining a subject's access to objects. That roughly an appropriate paraphrase. Yeah. That's one where you um, can read, I think it's, I don't know what happened. You write up or read down? Yes. Uh, yes, write up, read down, right? So in terms of level. So why did we start talking about Bella Padua? What was the context? Security. What was it? Security clearance. Security clearance, yeah, security levels, security categories, right? And specifically under the guise of mandatory access control. So what makes a mandatory access control system like this different from a discretionary access control? Whereas in a mandatory access control, that's certainly not the case, right? And this makes sense when we think about it in terms of a military security classification level context. Just because you have, you've created an item or you own an item, that doesn't mean that you get to choose the security level of that item, right? You can't just say, well, I'm going to give Bob read access to this file uh, because that could compromise the entire security, right? You're trying to make sure that things that are top secret are only read by people in top secret and that that information can never flow out. Cool. You said non, non discretionary, is it military level? Uh, mandatory access control. So the discretionary access control, the owner gets to control. Uh, mandatory access control, essentially the system controls the access rules, which is why we're defining the rules here. Um, and then what was the third one we talked about? Originator? Originator based access control. So what's the difference there? Yeah, whoever creates the data or creates the object can control who has access, right? So three, and these are the kind of three, I guess, discretionary and mandatory access control are the most common ones. So it's very important to understand the differences there. Originator based access control has um, other ties that we'll see. So great. Okay, so we on Thursday, yeah. Are there hybrid models like where you have like an overarching mandatory system and then like maybe a certain level within that system and then the owner base or whatever? Yeah, anybody have a Android phone? Yeah, so I think I'm pretty sure all Android phones have a combination of discretionary access control and mandatory access control. So the mandatory access control is I believe on Android it's called SE Android, it's Security Enhanced Android. It comes from Security Enhanced Linux, which is a mandatory access control that the NSA created for Linux. So it allows you to, so this allows the administrator, or you're not really the admin of your phone, this allows the device manufacturer, Google, Samsung, whoever, to add additional rules to lock down your device so that um, people can't, like this is used to control I believe on devices like access to microphones and something like on the file system, um, in addition to their provision based model. So, uh, this is a way of scoping and restricting access. So, modern systems kind of use combinations of both where they're most appropriate. Cool. All right. So, Bella Padula, on Thursday, we derived ourselves the rules for Bella Padula. So, somebody remind us what those rules were. We know at the Kind of at a, at a high level, we've talked about them as read up, write down. Is that right? So it just rewrites the other way, right? Yeah. Why? Because you want to be able to create the classified document data, but you don't want people 
lower than in the hierarchy for being able to read. There you go. So it should be which way? Should be read, read up and write up. Read down, write up. Right. So you can, if you have a higher security clearance, you can read anything below you. You can't read anything above you, above your security clearance level. And similar for writing, we can write up, but we can't create and write up to objects that are lower than our security level. Cool. So then how do categories then affect that? Because that seems like a very simple model. And why do we want categories? Yeah, so it gives us more fine grained control so that somebody with top secret clearance doesn't have access to everything that's top secret. They only have access to those categories that they need to do their job. Cool. So, what we did is we defined some notion of. Oh, jump up. We defined this notion of dominates, right? So we had uh, L and C. Right? So let's say this is for the subjects, and we have the objects, security level, and categories. So we'll just make this LS, CS, uh, LO, LC. So what was the relationship here like for, let's say, reading? So how do we know if we can read if a subject can read an object? So the levels, how do we write read read down? Yeah. Well the LS has to be greater than or equal to um, LO. And uh, and then there's an and and the same for the CS and uh, CC or C. What's the relationship here between these? Can I just use less than or greater than? C Why not? Oh, yeah, you can. Why not? Because they're sets. Right, because they're sets, right? So you can't, it doesn't really make sense to think about less than. So what's the relationship we want here? For a subset operator instead. Yeah, subset operator, right? In so we want so to be able to read an object, the subject must have the, the categories of the whatever it is, that should be oh, the categories of the object must be a subset of the categories of the subject. Does that make sense? And then right was reversed. So we can call this relationship dominates, and this is uh, and I don't know. Let me erase all of this so we can look at this nice. There we go. Fancy. OK, so we can call this dominate. So we just define this relation rather than having to define the inverse. We can say that uh, a security level dominates the other one if and only if the L is, this, we're using L and L prime instead of LS and LO, but basically it's essentially the same. So S can read, a subject can read an object if and only if uh, S in terms of levels and categories dominates O. The star property is the reverse of this, of right. So this guarantees us essentially write down, but also with categories. And then we have the star property of writing, so we can write up. And as we saw, we get actually a nice little lattice here. This is where the, ter the dominates term comes in. Uh, we get a nice little lattice here of different categories. This lattice could be uh, very big, but you can still always do the subset operation. Cool. OK. So now we can run through some examples very quickly to test to make sure we uh, got this covered. So A has top secret level and um, the category is ace, and B has secret, and the category is NATO and ace. So can A read something that is top secret and the empty set in categories? Yes. Yes, yes. why? Yeah. I mean, if you look at the definition, top secret is less than or equal to top secret. 
All right, first condition, top secret listening is the top secret. And moreover, um, the empty set is a subset of the pair. The empty set is a subset of the second thing, ace. So we can read that, yeah, cool. Okay, what about writing? Can we write to something that is secret, that has the category of ace? Why not? Right, because this would be us, we can write which direction? Up, and this is writing in which direction? This is a top secret writing to a secret document, so that's writing down. Other well, ways to think about it. what about reading top secret NATO ace? No, why not? Yeah, so NATO and ace is not a subset of ace, right? And think about the intuition here. By reading this document, they got access to NATO information, which is something that they're not clear for, right? A category that they're not clear for. Cool. Uh, writing, top secret, ace, NATO? No, why? Again, the ace, NATO is in the set of apes. Ace, NATO is not a subset of ace. That's correct. What about, so top secret, so writing, can top secret create a top secret document? Yeah. And what about the categories? Right, so for writing, it's the other way around. So for reading, reading the object needs to be a subset of the subject. Right, for writing, the, uh, the subject has to be a subset of the object. Right, but the way to think about uh, this document, again, this is kind of the writing up philosophy. Right, this A is creating a document that has both ace and NATO, which they will not be able to read, but they can still create it just fine, nothing writing this object doesn't uh, violate any of our overwriting security properties. Does that make sense? Just like we talked about being having secret clearance, writing a top secret document does not violate the security properties, right? It's part of writing up. Cool? Okay, I will leave you to do this later on your own. We don't need to walk through all these examples, but this is a good way to check yourself. Um, all right. This is not the only type of access control, so we've talked about different kinds of models, and actually a lot of what we've been talking about has been going to thinking about access control in terms of abstraction, right? So we keep, when we show the matrix and we show all the users and subjects, we say, hey, maybe it doesn't really make sense to think about individual users. Maybe it makes sense to group users into what their job does or what their role requires of them, right? So there's a whole bunch of research on role-based access control, which is an entire uh, area and field. This is probably the one of the most standard um, types of access control models. Uh, so basically, the user's permissions are determined by their role rather than who they are or their subject. So, um, so rather than the discretionary access control, which is the identity of the user, or the clearance level in mandatory access control. And this definitely has much more. So why does this have? Is this statement true that it's a more natural expression of business logic? Yes. Yeah. Yes? Why? Because usually you have like a boss or CEO, and then you have like people who might be below them who have access to certain things, but like maybe a newcomer doesn't. I think that's just a higher degree of the company. Yeah, so you can think, you know, in some sense, uh, the businesses are the abstract on this level, right? So you have different roles, software engineer, developer, tester, all these different kinds of roles. Rather than giving each person unique, let's say, job responsibilities per person, you think about people in terms of roles, right? Like, what does the role do? Those types of things. So it makes sense to model things in access control that way, right? Similarly, thinking about, uh, let's say, something like Piazza, right? Piazza has well-defined roles. There's, like, professor, TA, and students, and then TA and professors are kind of grouped into an instructor. So there's hierarchy of levels, but different people have different uh, access control on there. Cool. So another interesting topic, so this kind of came from role-based, and again, it's kind of, I think of it as an abstraction of role-based access control. So in role-based access control, everything is derived from what the user's role is, right? But the role may just be one aspect of a user. So. For instance, um, 
So every user, so we all have some attributes, right, that are associated with us. Maybe age, ID number, group membership. So you may be, um, and then you could make a complex Boolean expression on attributes. So for instance, uh, and this is actually used in, even in things like, let's say the law, right? So the law doesn't say that, uh, I don't know, if you think about, well, what's like a popular age-based restriction? Drinking. drinking, right? So the drinking age is 21 and over in most states, right? That's an access control policy that's based on what you? Is it based on who you are? Does the law say that these people can buy alcohol or purchase alcohol? I don't know what the law is. Based on age, it's based on an attribute of yourself. So if you're at the store and they're carding you, what are they trying to verify? They're trying to verify this attribute, right? To try to see, do you have the attribute that you are over 21? Um, interesting thing to think about is what other information are you giving them? What other attributes are you giving them when you give them your ID card? Your address, your height, weight, eye color, what else? Your driver's license number, is that useful information? Right, so you could maybe think of an interesting um, thing would be, uh, how could you prove that you're over 21 without also divulging all this other information? Right, so that's kind of an interesting attribute-based access control challenge. Of how can you prove that you're over 21 without revealing all this other information? Anyways, something to think about. So this is another kind of, and so one of your attributes could be role, Right, so in that sense, attribute-based access control is a little bit more, um, can encompass role-based access control, but you can um, get away with pretty complex things here. Any questions on these? Cool, and this is to show that it's not really just the three we're talking about, there's all types of mix uh, here. And I will say that uh, there's a lot of, I, I like to kind of end every section on what the kind of current state of research is in these areas. Uh, access control is a um, very active area of research. And I'd say some of the interesting things are on usability. So we, we talked about and um, use it, like, so why is usability of an access control system important? You don't want to get get in the way of of the user getting their job done by a long process or being right. restricted. Yeah, so you have two problems, right? So you have one the, the problem of uh, if you're getting the user's way, you may restrict them from doing their job. You have the other one of if the access control is too onerous, they will find ways around it, right? So uh, what else? What other use? Why else is usability important? So that's on the user side, yeah. Too, maybe your access control rules are too strict or too draconian or don't do what they're supposed to do. What about, um, yeah, so, uh, Like for the administrator of the system, if it's too complex to set up the rules, they're not going to use it. Yeah, so think about, so you think, uh, we talked about Android a little bit, right? So the companies that are writing those mandatory access control rules for your phones are small companies or big companies? Big, Google, Samsung, LG, Right, or some other Android <coughs> manufacturers. Huawei. Well, like, Huawei. Huawei. Yeah. Are those, like, I don't know, is anybody buying their Android phone from a tiny manufacturer? They'd be very interested to know. Uh, so, anyway, so you think those people are writing these access control rules that go into your phone, and there's research and papers that have studied those rules and said, actually, these rules, you know, there's a lot of different holes or flaws in these rules where a malicious application could. Uh, do something that they're not supposed to do because these rules aren't correctly created, right? So you have this problem of usability from both sides. It's important, especially in access control, to think about these things complementary, right? So usability of the end user, but also usability of the administrator to write these rules, to verify that they're correct. Um, all those kind of things that we talked about can be uh, things. Uh, flexibility, so why is flexibility important? Yeah. Flexibility in 
terms of uh, adding new users, changing roles, these kind of things, changing, adding rules, right? So how flexible and kind of related to that is a little bit of robustness or reliability. If we add a rule, is that going to break things? Are we going to allow something that we don't want to have happen? Uh, what about expressiveness? What does that mean? Yeah, so what type of rules do you want and what type of rules does the access control language allow you to express, right? So if you're just thinking about roles, and we talk about this a little bit, or we talk about this in the Unix access control model, right? It's a real pain to just share one file with one person in a Unix model because the only three things you have to give access to a file is the owner, the group, and everyone else, right? So it's difficult to express these kinds of rules. Doesn't mean that that's possible. Uh, federation is actually the other interesting thing. So when you think um, different organizations collaborating together, right? So think about, uh, let's say, anybody use the Gmail for their ASU email? Yeah, do you sign on, like how do you sign on to those, those systems? Yeah, you start with Gmail, and then it goes to ASU's login, and then ASU tells Gmail that yes, you are this user in the ASU system, right? So clearly there's collaborate, interesting collaboration there. Um, if you go into this, I think technically like ASU could be the one to kill that Gmail account. So they could restrict your access to it, not Google. So Google is following and abiding by essentially access control rules that ASU is creating, right? So. This is kind of the idea of federation is you have different entities that are in charge of different things. How do you link up and be able to talk and communicate between each other? Any other questions or thoughts on access control? Cool. Usually, yeah, right when I say that, somebody raises their hand. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so that would be one thing about flexibility, right? So let's say, um, so you had a system that is all role-based, right? So you say somebody gets promoted, you change their role, and then now they have whatever permissions they're supposed to have, great. Uh, what about somebody that's part-time, or that is splitting time between two different roles, right? Like if your system only allows one user to have one role, then it's flexible in some sense, right? Because you can easily add rules, change rules, but you can't express a policy that you want to express that says this user has two different roles, right? So you can work around that by having that, like creating two fake user accounts for that user that they need to go between to do different stuff, but then that's more negating the usability problems. So uh, these are kind of all linked in various ways, yeah? So is expressiveness the ability to do something you are not able to and flexibility like how easy to do that again? Yeah, I would say flexibility is very much um, how easy is it to, I would say, make changes or modify the, the system in general? And then expressiveness is, can you express your desired policy in the access control system? Right. So similar when you take, um, you can think of it in terms of if you, uh, when you take 340, different languages have different levels of expressiveness, things that you can ex uh, express in a language. But you can think of it just as, can I actually create an access, like does this system allow me to create an access control policy that does what I want it to do? Anything else? Just stare at you for two minutes. Okay. Cool. Then we will go on to cryptography. Uh, okay, so, but before, we get into this. So what is cryptography? Yeah. Something to do with encryption? Something to do with encryption, yes. Yeah. yeah usually there's a key involved. Usually there might be a key involved. Yeah. Puzzles. Puzzles. I like that. Ciphers. Ciphers. Yeah, so I guess would it, would it just be like the study of making sure only the people who need to see something can see it? Okay, the set, so maybe so there's maybe an underlying thing of and how does that tie into the free security properties we talked about? 
Yeah. Confidentiality. So maybe some way. And how um, has any? So. Uh, so yeah. Okay. So these are all good. Where is all this coming from? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Where do you learn all this stuff? Huh? Nowhere. <laughs> movies, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Are you saying like where do you learn the CIA? No, no, no. Cryptography. Like, right. what? Where are all these things coming from? Just like common concepts that are used day to day. Yeah. So cryptography is not like a super esoteric thing, right? It's something that we've all we've seen kind of in our daily daily lives. Um, so you can break it down a little bit into, and I'm not an um, linguist or etymologist or I don't know, whatever the person who studies word meanings are. Uh, I also don't know Greek, but apparently it's derived from the Greek words of hidden or secret and writing, right? So this actually gets to the core of all these concepts that we talked about, keeping things confidential, how you write something, how you convey information from maybe one person or one entity to another without revealing that information to somebody else. And kind of I like to think of it as how to keep information secret or hidden, right? So what, there's kind of, so what would be some, let's say, easy ways of keeping information secret? Yeah. I'm shutting it into a locked box and waiting until somebody else has the key to unlock the box. Okay, shoving it into a locked box and waiting for somebody to, uh, what if somebody breaks your lock? Well, Just bring a hammer to your lock. It's a terrible lock. Be a bad lock. Yeah. Well, like you can keep information secret using like mathematical principles like blockchain. Like, so maybe you can keep, well, we'll stop that for a second. We'll come back to that in a second. But you can keep it maybe secret using math. We'll, we'll yeah. stop there. Yeah. Uh, and just keep it secret by not telling anyone. Yeah, you can keep it secret by not telling anyone, right? That's actually a very good way of keeping information secret. <laughs> Right. If you're the only one who knows the secret. If you're the only one who knows the secret, exactly. So in this case, we assume one party has some information, right? So, yeah. Because I was reading about random number generators this mm -hmm. morning because I don't feel like they're random or whatever. But they were talking about a re um, profit, actually, and we're saying, like, if you can generate, like, pure random numbers, it is a way for a hacker to not use their historical and their numbers to get some information. Yeah, so we'll get into this. There's a lot of... Uh, Randomness actually has a big impact into cryptography. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, okay, so this kind of, so has anybody, so has anybody uh, developed a crypto system before? Never like the send messages to your friends in like elementary school or something? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, at a high level, you don't have to do <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it was just, uh, just we have symbols for letters to the, with the like, Caesar cipher. Yeah, so and basically, like making up a language that only you and the other side understand. Um, we had one when I was in elementary school. I think it was something like the first, you take the first letter of every word, and that would be the actual message. So you just write fake gibberish, and then, or whatever. Better is a sentence that looks right, and then you take the first. <laughs> Letter of each word, and that would be your actual message you're trying to send. Anybody else? Anybody else at all? Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago, a friend and I developed. I mean, it's just like covert channel essentially. Mm -hmm. And we were just saying like every offset between the time delay of the first packet and the second packet would be like a bit. Yeah. You know, a transfer message. Yeah. So yeah, you can hide. So this is kind of maybe hiding information rather than necessarily keeping it secret. Yeah. This big Latin. Pig Latin kind of counts. I don't understand Pig Latin, so I never learned. But yeah, you could say Pig Latin uh, kind of counts. Can you give us can you give us an example? <laughs> For people that don't know, you can look it up on Wikipedia. It's a like minor transformation to English word counts. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you could use it. Uh, my neighbors growing up did this. They would talk to each other in Pig Latin, and I wouldn't know what they were saying. <laughs> I should probably learn that at some point. Yeah, cool. Okay. So nobody, well, we touched on it briefly, but nobody mentioned uh, cryptocurrencies. Isn't that cryptography? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe instead of 
concealing information, it's more about, let's say, verifying or integrity, maybe? Yeah, like the reason, like, would you say cryptocurrency itself is secure, or the blockchain technology, like, underlying it, is a security feature? That is a, I don't know that I would say any of those things. Uh, I would say that, I mean, the interesting thing is how uh, crypto, and the word crypto has been um, subverted by the cryptocurrency and the blockchain, all these types of things. I think there are interesting things there. It's solving interesting distributed systems problems um, that they're using cryptography-based techniques, which is kind of why they get this name, but the key problem they're solving is one of kind of a distributed systems problem. Of how do you derive consensus with untrusted nodes in your network, right? So that's kind of the key thing that they're solving. Anyway, so yeah, we won't be talking a ton about cryptocurrencies in here. We're talking about keeping messages. So keeping messages secret, although maybe you'll learn enough here to be able to break some cryptocurrencies implementation of cryptography, which definitely happens. Cool. So before we get started, we need to actually define some terminology. So we talked, we actually already hit on some of these things. So and we can go kind of start with our general knowledge of you know, these words kind of being kicked around in English and then maybe try to refine them a little bit more. So what do we mean by encryption? Yeah. Yes, um, applying a reversible algorithm to like something you want to keep hidden. Okay, so uh, let's see. So applying a reversible algorithm. Yeah, so I, so uh, applying a reversible algorithm to say what's the last part? To something you want to keep hidden. To something you want to keep hidden or secret. So what about doing nothing? Is that an algorithm that's reversible? Yeah. Yeah, doing nothing? Is that a good encryption algorithm? No. Why not? It didn't do anything. It didn't, <laughs> why do we care that it didn't do anything? It's just, it's literally what you want to keep secret. It's just what yeah, it so is. it's not actually concealing the meaning, right? So we have this other requirement, um, and we'll get to the reversible in a second, but we can think of it in some way of just transforming a message, right, such that the meaning is concealed or hidden, right? So this is all the things we've been talking about, right? Pig Latin could be considered this. Maybe um, I had a. I think it was a middle school, high school teacher that recommended that we learn Greek because we were learning Greek letters to do like whatever formulas and stuff. And this uh, person said that we should use that, like learn the letters to write Greek to each other, and that would be a way to pass notes. Yeah. Isn't that like the opposite of understand it? Yeah, so we have uh, this interesting thing of like, how do we tell its meaning is concealed, right? And to what extent? So doing nothing is obviously not a good encryption mechanism, right? Uh, these other ones are also maybe not very great because all somebody has to do is look up Greek letters and match maybe like go backwards pretty easily. Cool. So what about decryption? Yeah. <clears throat> Right, so taking the, so the, you think of the opposite of encryption, and this is, well, kind of important because if, so let's say, okay, so the process of transforming an encrypted message back into original form. So, this gets back to the reversible thing. So let's say I have an encryption algorithm that just outputs random numbers. Do I have something that I've transformed a message so that the meaning is concealed? Yes. Yeah, but then how do you decrypt that? You can't. Hold you can't. On. Wow. Yeah. And have you transformed a message? I would say you destroy a message. Sure. I have a message that takes in a. Um, I have a message that takes in your plain text that you want to send. The yeah. message you want to send. Yeah. And I output it somewhere. But words. see, there's a distinction because if it's randomized, then it's no longer a message. Sure. What, what if I output all zeros? I output all zeros. Huh? What if I output all zeros? Well, then you're still destroying it because there's no longer a message. Transform a message, it has to start a message and end a message. If, if otherwise you aren't transforming it, you're destroying it. Yeah, so you have flip that. Yeah, so the key problem is this lack of a decryption mechanism, right? Because it's kind of a little bit tricky because as we'll see, a really good encryption algorithm will look random. 
right? I mean, we'll have all the properties of a random message, and that's what you want because it reveals nothing about the message itself. But if you don't have a decryption mechanism, that is basically useless. Like it's not really a crypto system. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll get that in a second. It's not quite, uh, we'll definitely get there. It's not quite in the information passing game of what we're trying to do here, right? So we have a, one entity who wants to communicate with another entity, something secret. So we'll, we'll build up that going. Okay, cool. Uh, crypto system, so this is something that it, is, I mean, it's just a, you know, a word, basically a system that describes how we encrypt or decrypt messages, right? So we can think of, you can think of Pig Latin as a crypto system. There's a way to translate English into Pig Latin, and there's a way to translate Pig Latin back to English, right? Cool. Plain text, these are just, and now we're just kind of uh, using more kind of cryptographer friendly terms. So these are all terms that we're going to use here. So plain text is the message in the original form. It's plain, hasn't been altered. Cipher text would then be the message in its encrypted form. So after we run the encryption function on the plain text, we get cipher text. Good, questions? A uh, cryptographer is somebody who invents encryption algorithms, and crypt analyst is somebody who breaks encryption algorithms or implementations. So I will, uh, I'm gonna, this is going to be a repeating theme I'm going to say over and over again. Um, it's totally fine to, for now, you should never be a cryptographer. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Yes, use well studied, well established standard cryptography libraries. Uh, and this is very, it's something that's very difficult for computer scientists to do because we like to build things, we like to say, oh, I can implement this crypto system. Uh, we'll see over and over again that um, this is fraught with peril and basically it's called like, don't, don't roll your own crypto, don't build your own crypto because you will there are many, many ways that crypt analysts have broken crypto systems where even if the math is beautiful and the math works, the implementation is flawed in really subtle ways. Um, so maybe I'll make you promise at the end of here once we've seen everything. Yeah. But it's totally fine to build it to learn. Yeah. We're assuming that the encrypted uh, libraries that already exist are unable to be broken by the crypt analysts. For sure. So that's part of keeping up to date of what the current latest attacks are and what they kind of mean. There's some aspect to that, but you'll know. Like, uh, if you're using, um, what's the name of Google's encryption algorithm? Google has a really good algorithm, or sorry, not an algorithm, a library that's available in a bunch of different programming languages. Uh, if you use that, you stick with like AES 256 bit, like you're, you're good. You will know when that's broken because that would be like a huge national story. <laughs> Yeah. So, for the cryptographer, is it an algorithm or a crypto system? That's a good point. Um, does a cryptographer invent the algorithm or the system? I don't know. I think that's splitting too many hairs at this point. Uh, I'd say, in some sense, like a cryptographer is most, most, I mean, I, and I would definitely not put myself in this category too. So, I'm not trying to tell you to don't be like me. I'm not a cryptographer, I don't invent encryption algorithms. I know how to use encryption algorithms to do various things, sometimes with research, but we're never rolling and building our own crypto system from scratch. Um, yeah? Say again? Uh, publicly broken, yeah. So there's a lot of people studying these types of things, right? So you would, um, if it's, ever become public knowledge that AES is broken, there will be massive, massive panic. <laughs> and as we'll see, I mean, crypto systems being broken are that it takes instead of whatever, two to the 256 brute forcing attempts, it takes two to the 250 brute forcing attempts. So 
Uh, that's when they consider it broken, and then it becomes big news, and everybody moves on to the next thing. Cool. OK, so we get some really interesting and nice security benefits from cryptography. The actual main one that we'll talk about is confidentiality. So this is kind of drives a lot of these. Uh, basically, what, what drove the study of cryptography is confidentiality, right? So we want to keep the secret things secret. As we'll see, there's actually um, integrity aspects. So we'll look at various types of things. But uh, what was integrity again? Yeah. Yeah, so you can think message or data, uh, data, right? You could verify that the data wasn't altered. So you could think of if we have a cryptographic system where I can encrypt something. And then I send that to you, you decrypt it. You can, with integrity, you could verify that nobody changed that information along the way. Right, so in addition to confidentiality, which would be knowing that nobody else was able to read the contents of that message, you could verify that nobody was able to change anything about that message. Which one's more important? Both important, kind of trick question. I think you could argue in different cases, certain ones are better than others. But in general, right, this is kind of uh, used a lot in authentication. We'll get to this in a bit. Uh, Non-repudiation. I think we touched on this in the overview. What was that? Right, so repudiation would be saying that, well, I didn't do this, I didn't send this message, right? So non-repudiation uh, would be you can't do that. So you can't claim that you didn't use your credit card or that you didn't um, send an email, these types of things, right? So this was um, another interesting property. Okay, we're gonna break it down and we're gonna study, crypto systems are, have a lot of formalism around them. We'll see. This is more of a preview. So you should be, uh, as we talk about these very as various aspects of crypto systems, what we can use cryptography for, you should be asking yourselves which of these properties does this help? And that does. So, yeah. Cool. Okay. So we can represent and think about crypto systems formally, a little bit more formally, as a Quintuple, so a five tuple, uh, where M is a set of plain text. So basically, what is the language of plain text? Key is some set of keys. So how many possible keys are there in your crypto system? Uh, C is a set of ciphertext. And then, so this is just saying, you can think of it as like, what does the input look like? What does the output look like? And what do keys look like? So why is a key important? What do we mean by key here? Yeah. Is it some, some sort of either text or something that's combined with the, the plain text to just alter it so it's harder to trace back? Yeah, so as, we, as we'll see, and what we'll define here, so you can think of encryption functions are you know, essentially mathematical functions that take in a plain text and a key and output what? Cybertext. This all this is saying mathematically, right? E is a set, and you could think of a crypto system could have one, one encryption function, it could have multiple. We'll kind of go into that, but it's not super important. But basically, you may have like inputs, right? So it's just a mathematical function that takes in a plain text and a key and outputs a ciphertext. And so a decryption function does what? Ciphertext and key and outputs what? Plain text. Plain text. Yeah, so the opposite, right? It needs to be able to do this. This makes sense. Uh, tip for reading math functions. I always think about them in terms of like types, right? So this is defining a function uh, that has the type, takes in ciphertext and a key and outputs plain text. Similarly, encryption is a function that takes in a type of plain text and a type of key and outputs ciphertext. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. So, where does the big need to keep secret things secret come from? The confidentiality. So I said like cryptography is like this old, well-studied topic. Why? People. You can't trust people? That is definitely true. Yeah. Sorry, I can't hear. We wanted to keep things secret, so just about as long as we've existed. Okay, we wanted to keep things things secret for about as long as we've existed. In what context, though? Or, or, yeah. I don't know. Is Orcs still kind of like that? Or like Kangaroos? But I think it's something to do with like. Yeah, so war. So you, Morse code is uh, would be a very poor crypto system because it's um, whatever. It's easily like the key. There's only one key, right? Of so like translating back and forth. But you could think about a crypto system on top of Morse code, right? Um, and we'll actually get to that. So you could think of Morse code as just a transmission uh, transmission mechanism. But you could take your original message, encrypt it, and then send it over Morse code to somebody else. Um, good, cool. Yeah, so war, right? So why is uh, why are secrets useful in war? Yeah. You don't want your enemies to know what you want to do. Yeah, you don't want your enemies to know what you want to do. Why? We'll use it against you. Yeah, they can, they can use it against you. They can ambush you. What else? Yeah. Uh, you won't be able to like transmit it easily, like over radios. But anyone can pick up the radio soon. Yeah. So you may want to be able to transmit it. Well, go older before radios. Yeah. Receive them the wrong. Yeah, so you don't want, let's say, uh, so like olden times, right? You have a messenger you have to dispatch that has to like ride a horse or run or do something to go to your other general that's somewhere else. And so you have to worry about what's happening when you send this messenger off. You mean it's intercepted? So intercepted, so that now the uh, enemy knows your plans. What else do you have to worry about? Yeah. The guy defecting. The person defecting? Yeah, that's bad. Yeah. If your other general even got the message. If the other general even got the message, right? So maybe the, the person got lost and just never arrived. It was like a benign thing. Yeah. The message got changed. Maybe somebody intercepted it along the way and maybe even unbeknownst to the messenger. So they think it's exactly the same. Yeah. The messenger is dumb and forgets the message. The, yeah, the messenger, well, dumb and forgets the message. I'm sure they would not show up in that case. <laughs> Right, so all these things are real world things, and this is and this has been around since literally, I mean, forever, right? As long as, um, so the first cipher we'll look at is really inspired from an old cipher. So this is called the Caesar cipher, uh, and this is literally so. This is from um, a text called the Life of Julius Caesar, and I think it's uh, 56 A.D. No, that doesn't make sense. I don't know what that 56 is for. Maybe it's 56 volume. Anyways, you can look it up, this quote. Uh, if he had anything confidential to say, he wrote it in a cipher. That is, by so changing the order of the letters of the alphabet that not a word could be made out. If anyone wishes to decipher these and get at their meaning, he must substitute the fourth letter of the alphabet, namely D for A, and so on with the others. So what does that mean? Yeah, so how many letters are there in English? We're going to go over this a lot, so we should make sure we're all... 26. 26. So then by shifting the entire... So you have the alphabet from A to Z, right? So shifting it by four, you have the first letter be B, and the last one be C. I don't really know, but uh, I think that's right. So what's, okay, so let's actually think about this a little bit in the context here. So what's some of the benefits of this? Yeah. Yeah, so there could be, you, if you look at it, it just looks like what? Gibberish. Like gibberish, right? It doesn't look like, I mean, obviously they're not writing English, but we'll think about doing English. Right? It doesn't look like valid words. Um, right? So then, yeah. So it's got easy decryption and encryption. You can do it. Right. So is that useful being able to use it to do it by hand? Sometimes. Yeah, because what's the alternative? Do they have computers? 
<laughs> well, people with, I mean, being able to read and write was like a luxury in this time, right? So you can easily, so what do you need to know? So if we're going to exchange a message in this crypto system, what do each of us need to know? Yeah. Um, just how much you ship the by in which direction. So we need to know somehow the key, right? And the key in this case is what? Yeah, a number to shift, right? So it could be, so what numbers are bad? Zero. Zero? Zero is bad? 26 is also bad? Yeah, so right, all of these things are bad. So we can think that there's, you know, there's clear um, guidelines or rules to using these. And we can represent this and kind of look at this using our the formalisms that we've created. So in this case, what's M? So what is our plain text in? We're going English. English <laughs> alphabet. Yeah, but what in English? Letters. Alpha. So letters. So what letters? A through Z. A through Z. What about uppercase? No, why? <laughs> yeah, how do you shift, like, if you're doing this by hand, how would you shift, like, uppercase A versus lowercase A? Right, would you also shift those uppercase, in which then what are you getting from having uppercase versus lowercase? Right? So we'll just do one case. Uh, what about spaces? Ignore spaces, why? Yeah, because what do we shift spaces to then, right? It becomes, and then what does, so like in our A through Z alphabet, where do you put spaces, right? There's not actually a natural placement for space. And so the shift, how do you know where that is? So one way we can get around this is just say ignore it. And then what do we do when we send, when somebody's decrypting a message? Yeah, they have to then, they get, they have to put the spaces back in to be able to read the message, right? should be fairly easy once we see the plain text. Cool. All right, so we can represent this pretty easy. So M is a set containing sequences of letters, right? So just A through Zs. What's the key? There's a shift. Number of shifts. Yeah, so we'll use, uh, and we'll say that, does it really make sense to have shifts 26 or higher? No, at a certain point, we're just looping back over the same letters. So we can just say, you know, key zero is the same as key 26, which is the same as whatever that times two is, which I wasn't able to do in time while I was talking. Yeah. Yeah, well, we can think of it as a crypto system. The key could be anything from zero to 25. And then we can talk about later the properties of different keys, right? We could say key zero is bad. All right, cool. And then we can do the encryption. So we can go over. So the encryption function would be basically if we number, right? The, so this is we can represent this a little bit mathematically. We can represent the letter M. So zero would be one, or sorry, A would be zero, B would be one. Right? Plus K, so shift it. And then what's the mod 26 doing? Yeah, if we do Z plus 1, maybe it's a loop back around to A. Right? So that would be 25 plus 1 is 26, mod 26 is 0. I hope that worked. Cool. So this we're defining the encryption function. Decryption function. What does that look like? The M minus K stuff. Yeah, we can kind of do it in many different ways, right? We could say, uh, so here, and this is actually an interesting point. Why are we using M in the encryption function and C in the decryption function? C is part of the ciphertext, and M is part of the plain text, right? The plain text is capital M. Ciphertext is C. We also don't have it on here, although maybe we'll get to it, but what is the uh, set C? Oh, 
It's the next one. It's the same as M, right? So our ciphertext is exactly the same language as our plain text, right? Which makes sense. We don't put an encryption out of uh, whatever, A through Z, and we don't get out numbers, right? We're only going to get out A through Z. They're all going to be shifted the exact amount. Questions on this? Yeah. Are we adding twenty six or can we just think of things that would cross the part back? I don't know. It's a good question. I think it just doesn't do anything. Uh, is the question why we're adding by twenty six? Yeah. It's so we don't get a negative number that we Yeah, I think it just makes it easier for representations, like for display purposes of so yeah. But you could very easily get rid of that. The mod will handle negative numbers, but yeah. Cool. So this is our formal crypto system. So you are a, uh, I don't know, a well edge I don't know how to say this. Uh, you've been transported back into Roman times. You've somehow met up with some barbarians who are attacking the Romans. You have, you have some messages that you've stolen from Caesar. Uh, how do you attack this? You don't have the key. What do you have? So when I say attack this, yeah. So first, we need to define some things. So you're now the adversary. You're the person who wants to break the crypto system. What do we assume that you have, or what do we think that you have? Yeah. Are we assuming that we know that it's a that this specific type of criticism, or are we just assuming that it could be any type of code? Yeah, you'd say, well, I was really lucky I went to uh, 365 today because I magically <laughs> got transported back and have to solve a Caesar cipher. Well, a message I have to solve a cipher, and the message is written by Caesar. So, <laughs> assume you know old Roman, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so we have to kind of define for the rest of this. So let's say some assumptions. So can we assume that we know the key? No. Why not? Yeah, because we're not really the adversary in that sense, right? If we stole the key, we have, and now we have, let's say, ciphertext, and we have the key, what can we do? Supply it. Yeah, combine them with the decryption algorithm to get the plain text. Right? We're not actually breaking the crypto system in there because the this assumes that the two sides have the same key. Right? And we don't necessarily know what the key is. Yeah. Can we take like small chunks of them, maybe like two words, and then just do multiple iterations of them, just constantly shifting the letters and see until so one makes a make sense word that makes sense. Yeah, so let's let's uh, pause a little bit. We want to talk about kind of so this is so we'll as, one of the things we should always assume is that the adversary knows the algorithm but not the key right we we talked about okay it makes sense not to know the key but is this a realistic assumption should we assume that they don't know the algorithm So it could be that um, somebody from Caesar's army defected to our side, and so now we know the algorithm that's being used. What about in general? So you're attacking some crypto system, yeah. Yeah, so there's standards of what algorithms to use so that the details of the encryption system are public. So, yeah. Yeah, so even a closed source system, right? It's, if it's a binary that you're distributing, I can reverse engineer the binary and understand the algorithm. So the way to think about it in another way is if the security of your system, if you say this, my system is secure if nobody knows the algorithm that I'm using, then in that sense, your algorithm is part of your key, right? And 
so you say, well, if you, can, if you keep your key secret, then you can keep, I mean, in that sense, if the algorithm is released, it's just as bad as releasing the key, so you have a really crappy algorithm, right? Because the whole thing is gonna fall apart whenever anyone knows what you're doing. Much better to assume the adversary already knows exactly how your system works, and then say, okay, what can they do? Can they break this crypto system? This is a general security property called the, uh, well, uh, or I guess insecurity principle of security through obscurity, where people like to convince themselves that, aha, I've made something really awesome, but nobody will be able to find it, or nobody will be able to know what it is, therefore it's secure. All right. So we assume we know the algorithm. Now, there are various different ways that an adversary, like different, let's say, powers that an adversary could have, right? So, and we're talking about breaking crypto systems, right? We want to either maybe steal, like we want to infer the key from a message, right? So there'd be different types of things that we want to do. So let's say we captured, our barbarians have captured a messenger. What do they have access to? Ciphertext. Do they know what the plain text is? No. Right? Do they know what the key is? No. It could be anything in that set. In our set, what's the size of the keys? 26. 26. That's not very large, right? But let's say it's in the millions, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we, let's say um, Caesar's generals, before they went out on this thing, they all were in a room together, and they were in the Roman camp, and there's nobody around, like, and so they said, the key is gonna be 21, whatever, right? And then they all disperse, and then now they can send messages to each other with this key. Right, so we could assume that we have the ciphertext. Right? So we can assume, okay, we have the ciphertext, we've stolen maybe one message, maybe we've stolen n messages, we've stolen a bunch of different messages, but we only have access to the ciphertext. Right? In that case, what are our goals? What are we trying to do? Find the proper key. One thing to do would be find the key, right? Find the key that was used to encrypt this message. What else though? Do we need to find the key? Isn't that just brute force what I mean? What it makes yeah, but more high level, right? So we can try to find the key, but what else are we trying? What else could we find? Yeah. Well, I suppose the things you're looking for are the key. You're looking for the algorithm, and then you're looking for uh, and once if you have the algorithm, can you brute force by just trying a bunch of different things on the algorithm? And then the this, last yeah, go ahead. Sorry, the last thing that you can look for in this example specifically, at least, is uh, pattern between the ciphertext and real key. So a very common... So this is more... Let's, let's, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's okay. No, no, no. It, it's okay. We're talking more uh, high level about what capabilities an adversary could have. So it doesn't have to apply necessarily to this crypto system. It could apply to any crypto system, right? So we can... If we have the ciphertext, we may want to steal the key, right? Or we may want to derive the key from the ciphertext. Yeah. Could also, like... Yeah, so maybe we can uh, manipulate the ciphertext. That's why I've been saying uh, attack. But maybe, so can we maybe derive, what if we were able to derive the uh, plain text without knowing the key? Still useful? Yeah, if we can read this one message, that's great. I mean, it's not as good as stealing the key, but it's still pretty good, right? Okay, so then a more stronger adversary, yeah. Don't know, we'll see. We'll see how that impacts things. But on a high level, you need, you need 10 barbarians that can read and write, I think you've got <laughs> high standards for your barbarians. But, but maybe, I don't know, it wasn't there. So okay, one thing that an attacker could have is just access to ciphertext, right? What else could maybe they get access to? Yeah. Yeah, so they could get access to ciphertext and plaintext, right? So they could, um, 
get what's called a known plain text. So you have ciphertext and you know what the plain text of that is, right? You don't know in this case what? Key. The key. You don't know the key, right? The third one's a little bit different. That doesn't really apply in this case, but uh, let's say uh, that Caesar had a um, encryption as a service mechanism or something, and so he had somebody that you could put in uh, messages in one end, and you would get encrypted messages out of the other end, right? So he had a team of people just doing encryption all day because, like, he didn't want to do it himself, right? So he has a tent that does this. Uh, and so if you're able to then write your own messages, put it into the tent, and have a ciphertext come out, that would be, you'd have more capabilities than either one of these. Does that, do you agree with that? Right, because in the second case, you don't choose, so. You may just have access to only the ciphertext. You may ask, have access to ciphertext and plain text. Uh, and you may, so. You know, think about war concepts, right? So maybe we, you can steal a message for ciphertext only. You can steal many messages. Uh, known plain text. Maybe you have been able to convince the messenger to tell you what the plain text of that document is. Or in other types of war scenarios, you have spies that on the inside that are able to steal the plain text of the message. So now you didn't choose the contents of that plain text, but you know exactly what the ciphertext is. And then, so let's say we had this uh, magical hut that would uh, encrypt uh, plain text with Caesar's key. What plain text would you encrypt to get the key? Yeah. The, whole the alphabet. The whole alphabet, A through Z. Can you do it easier? A. Yeah. So just have a message A. You pop it in. What comes out? Yeah. One of the offset of the key, right? If it's D, then that means the key is four. Yeah. Right, but so this way, so if you just put, so if you had something that would give you ciphertext for plain text if you're choosing, you put in A, it will give you the key back, right? In the Caesar cipher example, yeah. <laughs> Bigger than I will service Caesar's hut. <laughs> <laughs> You can encrypt all the vowels, yeah, there you go, yeah. Can you just give them the cipher text and eventually can you just keep giving it to them until it shifts enough that the key pops out? So the key is constant here. So the key is, Caesar has decreed that the key now is 21 in this hut. So this is actually a good point. Every plain text that you come in, right, the cipher text will be exactly the same if it's the same plain text. So if you give it cipher text, text though. And if you give it cipher text. And after so many iterations. Ah, okay. It will sh shift it. I don't know how the number line works in that way. I don't know. Maybe that will be true. I don't know. It's a similar version of brute forcing it. Uh, maybe you'll get there faster. I'm not really certain. Uh, cool. Okay. So we've talked about a lot of these things. So we've talked about different ways we can attack this system. Right? So. One of kind of, and thinking, I like to think of it kind of like uh, at the base and going up. So not necessarily so much in these examples, uh, because the math that we're doing here is just like shifting numbers, right, on the Caesar cipher. But we could, if we're smart and clever enough, find underlying problems in the mathematics of the crypto system, right? So. I'd say it probably doesn't necessarily exist in the Caesar cipher, but in other ones we should think about this and we'll see examples where people, very clever, very smart people, have found ways to break crypto systems based on this. We can also look at statistics, and some people mentioned this a little bit. So they talked about analyzing words in the ciphertext, so if we just have the ciphertext. So what are we looking for there? Common words? Why common words? Why does that make sense? Yeah, okay, so there I'd say we have actually a known plain text attack, so we know that the message ends with like dash Caesar or something. Well, not dash, but Caesar. And so we could use that. Um, not necessarily a statistical attack, but kind of similar, yeah. Um, even for the Hassan letter, and the key is the most common. Yeah, so English, right? 
So if you know the language that this is written in, is every letter the same? Use the same? Why not? I don't know why not, but it's not, right? You know this by playing Scrabble or any game like this, or just thinking about sentences that I've used and letters, how many Zs have I used? Very little until that one, right? So the frequency distribution. So you can make statistical attacks based on assumptions of the underlying language, and we'll see exactly how to do this in the Caesar cipher and other ciphers, right? So we can look at the ciphertext and say, well, in English, I think it's E is the most common, but I can't remember exactly. We can say E is the most common. We can look up the frequency of every character in the ciphertext, and we say uh, Q is the most common. Now, what does that mean we should probably try as the key? Yeah, whatever shifts E to Q. I don't know what that number is, right? But we should try that. And then that may be our, our key. But let's say we have a perfect crypto system. So the math is great. It hides all of the traces of the language in the output. Is our system secure? Nobody wants to commit to an answer. Yeah. So one thing would be, and this is the thing we'll look at, right? So. It's kind of a mathematical type attack, but yeah, we could try every key, right? There's only 26 keys, it's not going to take us that long. We need 26 barbarians, we'll be done like that, right? But if it's uh, in the billions or trillions or, I don't even know, larger numbers, right? Trying every key would be infeasible and we'll never try all the keys. So what else? What other things can we attack? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yes. Kind of. I mean, it's tricky. I don't know. It's a difficult question. Can you ever take out the human element? Well, in some sense, the human element is there, right? Because this crypto system needed to be implemented in something, right? And so maybe we can attack the crypto system. Uh, there's a fascinating uh, paper where they were able to leak the encryption keys from a remote system based on a timing attack. Because depending what input you gave, the, um, the crypto system would take slightly different amounts of time on your input, which depended on the key itself. So you could leak out the key from a crypto system actually completely remotely, like over the network. Um, so this is one of those things. So crypto systems have to have constant time operations, which makes them very difficult and a pain to actually develop because you want the time, multiply, add, all these types of things to not depend on key information. Um, it is very easy to mess these things up, and the literature is littered with these failures. Um, cool. So, okay. So we're first going to look at uh, what we call like classical cryptography. So these are things that people used to do by hand because, well, because you can do them by hand. Because they're fairly easy to understand. Um, the key idea is that the sender and receiver must share the same common key, right? This is something that we talked about. It has to be the case that they share the key. This is also called symmetric cryptography. So what's the symmetry here? Key. Wow. That's it. Well, that's true. Maybe the algorithms are symmetric. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. Um, I would also say that you, both sides need the key, right? So they, they must be having the same key. Uh, we're going to look at two basic types of algorithms. Substitution ciphers, which just like the Caesar cipher, you substitute A for one letter for another letter in your crypto system. Uh, other ways are transposition ciphers where you just mess up the order of things. And you combine these using, uh, that doesn't make sense. I think it's product ciphers, how that should be ordered. Uh, products of these two. And all symmetric crypto systems, including DES, AES, are all based on these two principles. So that's why we're gonna study these from the bottom up.